an arrangement that mixed Ashes of Dreams and Yona from the Near Replicant soundtrack. I chose Near Replicant for my first video not just because of today's release of the new version, but also because the Near series has what I consider to be one of the most interesting soundtracks in gaming. Not only is there a quite frankly absurd number of official arrangements of the soundtrack, including jazz, tango, and fugue versions, but it mixes old and new ideas in a way that perfectly matches the game's off-the-wall presentation of its much darker themes. So how does it do this? Well, to start with, we need to talk about the game's themes. In addition to being a cautionary tale of the dangers of letting an android make their own fashion choices, the Nier series focuses heavily on transhumanism and splitting the body from the self or the soul. One of the ways it plays on these themes is with its significant usage of religious imagery throughout the game. It makes sense, then, to use music that parallels these religious ideas. So what makes music sound like it belongs in a church? Well, for a substantial part of European history, one of the main sponsors of music was the church. Several standards emerged that make music sound like it belongs in a church, but also serve as the basis of what we know now as classical music. The Nier soundtrack uses several of these elements, including an instrumentation that makes heavy use of organs and choruses, but the one that is the most interesting as both a musician and, I think, as a listener, is how it uses counterpoint. Now, counterpoint is a very complex subject, and I could spend hours talking about its usage in the Nier soundtrack alone, but for our purposes, I want to focus on a very basic definition. In music, when we have multiple people playing different lines, we call each line a part. At any given point in a part, it's either a melody, a harmony, or a rest. Now, rests are simple enough. That's when you aren't playing. Easy. But the difference between a melody and a harmony is more complicated. Generally, we define a melody as a series of notes that's interesting to listen to on its own, whereas a harmony is unobtrusive either by being a series of slow notes or by copying the melody and bringing it up or down in order to blend in and be unobtrusive in a way that still augments the music as a whole. What makes Counterpoint special is that it has multiple distinct melodies playing at the same time in a way that serves a higher harmonic function. This makes for more interesting music both to listen to and to play, not only because it makes it sound very rich and complex, but because every time you go back and listen or play the music, you can focus on a different line and how that line contributes to the music as a whole. As an example, here is a short excerpt from my recording. Now, let's listen to each of the melody parts on their own. Now let's put them back together. Try listening to a part other than the highest one. Pick a note at the start and follow the line as it goes up and down all the way from the start to the end. Of course, you can do this with the whole recording. So if you're interested in hearing more of this counterpoint, go back through and listen for different lines in the background because they each have something new and unique to say. This excerpt also features a tool of counterpoint that's used to make multiple melodies more interesting, and it's called a suspension. If you're familiar with chord notation, you might know this as a sus chord. In a suspension, a note is held through a chord change, which creates dissonance. Dissonance is a tension between notes. For example, if I play a B flat and an A flat via dissonance, B flat, A flat, play them together, that's dissonance. When we hear a dissonance change to a consonance, or notes that sound like they belong together, we call that a resolution, and the tension is released. I'm going to play the same dissonance, B flat to an A flat, but then I'm going to move the A flat down to a G, and that's going to move the dissonance to a consonance. It's going to resolve the dissonance. So we have our dissonance with our B flat and A flat, and then we're going to move to a consonance with B flat and G. So let's hear that together so we can hear the resolution. That sounds nice, right? It's like tensing a muscle 
and then relaxing it. You don't really appreciate how nice it feels to be relaxed without that tension being there in the first place. But what does a suspension sound like in the middle of music? I'm going to play three chords from the same excerpt. The suspension happens on the second chord and then resolves to the third chord. I'm going to play the same three chords again, but this time without the suspension. So instead of resolving on the third chord, we're going to get a nice consonant chord for the second one. Finally, I'm going to play the recorded version of that excerpt. If you want to hear what this might sound like without the elements of counterpoint, listen to Dance of the Evanescent from the Near Replicant soundtrack. It uses the same melody as Ashes of Dreams and Yona, but takes away the counterpoint and turns it into a waltz. Listen for the difference in complexity and the difference in the amount of tension. So now I'm going to move on to some musical decisions that all string players have to make. The first of these is how connected you want your notes to be. Unlike an instrument like the piano, bowed instruments can play notes with no gap between them whatsoever. We do this by changing the note in the left hand in the fingers without changing the right hand or the bow. It sounds like this. So why don't we just play all notes like this? Well, for starters, there's a technical reason. Eventually, you're going to run out of bow, no matter how slow you move it. But sometimes, we want to make the change in notes more obvious to serve a musical goal. For instance, listen to this excerpt. Now, we could play these all in one bow like this. That sounds fine, but if we change the bow halfway through, it gives it a lot more interest and it adds an urgency that, at least for me, makes for much better music. Now, whether or not you want to make this choice is an artistic decision, and not everyone is going to play it the same way. But this is why we like some musicians and not others. It's why I probably have a favorite musician who's different than your favorite musician. Next time you're listening to music with strings in it, pay attention to where they move notes together in what we call a slur, and when they change bows for a different effect. One problem with changing bows, though, is it's really hard to do it smoothly. If you play a stringed instrument, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, sometimes you want a long stop between notes, not a smooth transition, but I don't think it sounds very good in this arrangement. So how do I change bows without stopping the sound? Well, the secret is all in the right hand wrist and fingers. Think about them as shock absorbers for your bow. When you change the direction of your arm, it abruptly changes the direction of the bow, like this. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the idea. But watch how I move my fingers when I change directions and how this changes the sound. So on an up bow, my hand moves like this, and when I change, and when I change back. So you have this gentle motion that again, absorbs the change of the bow and makes for a much smoother, gentler sound. So it sounds like this. That's much better, right? I wanna end this video by talking about a few things that I'm currently practicing. I know that when I was a student musician, I thought that everyone at a certain point just sort of stopped having to work on these things. They had it all figured out. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. We're just kind of embarrassed by the fact that we still make mistakes. Of course, nobody likes to talk about their mistakes, but it can be discouraging when you feel like you're the only one who's struggling to do what you want to do. Um, now, personally, I'm quite frankly a bit out of practice, and that means I get physically tired after playing for an hour or two. Um, one of the ways that this affects my playing is that I tense up my left wrist. It's the difference between this, tensed, and this, relaxed. Now, this affects my playing in a number of ways. For one, it makes it hard to keep my vibrato consistent from note to note. It also makes my fingers just slower to respond because everything in the wrist is tensed up and that affects the way the fingers move. It also makes it hard to play some notes in tune and can even cause long-term health problems if you don't fix it early enough. So the way I've been practicing this is every 30 seconds, I stop playing and I check my wrist. I say, 
Is it tense or is it relaxed? Sometimes I'll give it a little wiggle like this. If I can move it around, it's probably relaxed. If I can't, it's tensed up. By policing myself like this, I'm able to get in the habit of just relaxing all the time. And even in just a week or two of practicing like this, I've already made some progress. The other thing I'm working on is my string crossings, especially as my right arm gets tired, but quite frankly, this is never something I was great at. My arm doesn't quite end up in the right place. Depending on the angle that your arm takes, our bow is going to rotate forward and backwards. Now, we always want our bow to be parallel to the bridge because this is when we get the most consistent sound. But, you know, nobody's perfect. Sometimes my bow is crooked. It's not this extreme, but it's maybe like this. Now, it's something I would like to fix and it will make my playing sound better if I do. So I've been taking 20 minutes just standing in front of a mirror, practicing my string crossings. These are fast notes, these are short notes. These are long bows, they're short bows. They're small string crossings from one string to another and big string crossings all the way from one side of the violin to the other. And just by looking in a mirror, I'm able to watch myself and see if I'm doing it the right way. So that's what I'm practicing this week. Let me know what you're working on or listening to, and let me know if there's a soundtrack or music topic that you'd like for me to cover. Until next time.